inquiry if your questions do not get answered in the course of this webinar presentation, yeah, and I, I don't do them chronologically, I do them whatever order seems fun, send me email, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org, and I'll be delighted to forward your questions to the professors so they can have the option of responding to you. Also, don't worry if you have to leave halfway through. This is going being recorded and will be up on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours. Having said all that, um, Professor Klein, may I ask if you would go first? Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Um, when I uh, teach 19th century, 20th century American literature, it often comes up like, what are the most influential books in our country's history? And I, and I, I, I want to separate students from like, well, here's the most influential and here's the best, because they're not necessarily the same. And I tell them, like, here's my list. Here's my top five. And number one is Uncle Tom's Cabin in terms of just impact on American culture. Uh, number two is Grapes of Wrath. And number three is The Catcher in the Rye. When this book comes out in 1951, uh, it is the youth rebellion before we think of the youth rebellion of the 1960s. Um, on a more personal level, I, I read this book when I was a teenager, and uh, I, it was the first real book I started reading. I, I read Les Miserables to try and impress a girl. Um, didn't really do, didn't really do anything, but uh, but Catching the Rye struck me in a way. And one of the reasons it struck me, and I think it struck, it became so influential in the mid twentieth century, wasn't just this idea of rebellion. We've had rebel ideas of rebellion throughout the entire history of our culture and then Western culture as well. There was something about the idea of a pious rebellion, that, that this book was not interested in rebellion for the sake of rebellion. It was not interested in turning the music up really loud to annoy the parents, to do the opposite of whatever they think. It was a rebellion marked in piety which then makes clear certain moments when some the Holden gets a prostitute and he only wants he only wants to talk to her. He goes and gets drunk in the midst of wanting to talk to him, to talk to other people. There's a sense of piety to it. And uh, you know, a, a phrase that gets used a lot in Salinger's writing is this uh, in this, you know, innocence in a corrupted world. And I think that's a that's a completely valid, fair phrase. I just I want. I think it's helpful to think about that phrase as a theological and ideological phrase and not just as a phrase about, say, children. Um, and that's actually what I want to talk about. I sort of want to sort of thematize my comments on what has made the book so important to me is its sort of theological vision. Um, Salinger, Salinger was in World War II. And his life in World War II, it's like a greatest hits of World War II. He was, a, he was in intelligence and he was at D-Day. He was at the liberation of Paris. He was at the Battle of the Bulge and he was at the liberation of Dachau, one of the death camps. And needless to say, going through all of those experiences, he came out um, a traumatized, changed person. And when he comes out, he becomes more and more interested in uh, especially Eastern religions, uh, Hinduism and Zen Buddhism. But at the same time, Christianity, uh, but especially Eastern forms of Christianity. And while Salinger doesn't have a huge corpus, uh, this kind of spirituality is constantly working throughout all the books. His, his most sort of ubiquitous character is named Seymour Glass. And Seymour Glass is essentially a mystic in Hindu and Buddhist theology. One of his quote unquote books, two stories called Franny and Zoe, the center of that plot revolves around the Jesus prayer which is Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, and I, I would just put forward that, that the catcher in the rye is doing what all these other texts are doing. It is intensely interested in spiritual inquiry so that you can attain, uh, well, a religious, if not religious, but a metaphysical transcendence. And for something like, for something like catcher in the rye, that might seem really strange because you've got a teenager who smokes like a chimney and swears like a sailor, and it doesn't really seem to fit. He's not this pious, pious boy who's just sort of walking around. What, what does he say? I think he quotes himself by saying, I'm sort of an atheist. 
And when he, he doesn't like the disciples, but he really likes Legion, the, the lunatic who is in the, in the graveyard. But as Harold Bloom pointed out, as a lot of people have pointed out, that that line of him really liking Legion, the, the lunatic in the graveyard is important because that man in the graveyard in the gospels contains all of these demons, while at the same time contains the same virtue that will allow him to follow Christ and be obedient to Christ's wishes. And, and Holden Caulfield is going to contain these things as well. And so to look at the catcher in the rye as a movement, not necessarily a, a clearly linear movement, because there's not a clear beginning and a clear end to it, but a movement in a young man who is actually trying to, who, who knows enough, knows enough to know that he needs, if we want to say redemption or enlightenment or a new consciousness, I want to be vague in these terms because I think Salinger is as well, um, even while he contains the very things that keep him from attaining that. Um, and uh, I, I just want to spend what little time I have left just looking at a few moments to show you like what this looks like in The Catcher in the Rye. And one of them is uh, the very famous, it comes up several times. It comes into his mind before he even gets to New York City is the ducks in Central Park. And uh, to think about this, asking the question, what happens to the ducks? What happens to the ducks? He thinks about himself and he asks, asks a couple cab drivers. He might ask Luce as well, I think. Um, that to say that this is not a question that actually has an answer, that this is much more of a Zen Cohen. Uh, a Zen Cohen would be a Zen saying that is not meant to be unraveled. It's a knot that is always sort of in a knot. It sort of represents a spiritual project. Um, one of Salinger's books, Franny and Zoe, opens with a Zen Cohen. And it's so famous that it's cliche to us, but part of the reason it's famous is because of Salinger is, we know the sound of two hands clapping. What is the sound of one hand clapping? So Cohen's were very close to uh, Salinger's heart. And I think to see this asking this question of the ducks is not a sense of like, hey, I actually just want an answer to it, or at least it's not only that, but this is this, this recitation of the Zen idea. Um, if that's sort of a Buddhist idea, we can think of it, um, we can think of something in terms of a Christian idea with Ali and his brother. Um, because again, I think Salinger was open, sort of open-minded about, uh, he, he wanted to take the best of Buddhism, the best of Hinduism, the best of Christianity. And so we look at Ali and we basically, in Ali, we have a Christian saint. Um, we have someone who um, has been martyred. We have a kicking against death, not seeing death as natural or good or any sort of like, hey, we all, we're all warm food eventually. No, instead, I, I sort of kick against the pricks of Ali's death. He carries a relic around with him, which is that baseball glove, which he not only writes about the baseball glove early in the book, he carries it with him. Um, when we get towards the end of the book and he's coming closer to his quote unquote um, nervous breakdown, that he starts making an intercessory prayer over and over again, the way a Catholic or Orthodox might make an intercessory prayer to a saint. Ali, don't let me die. Ali, don't let me fall. Don't let me fall. Don't let me fall. That in this sort of the movement of his relationship with Ali is the, is the movement of a spiritual pilgrim coming closer and closer to their saint. Um, and then just a, a final one is that last moment. I'm sure we're going to talk about that last moment in, in other ways, which is the carousel. And, and seeing this carousel as a religious, as a religious moment, um, as a religious moment of beauty, that the rain that comes down on Ali's grave, which is so disturbing to him, is now the rain that comes down on him is very cleansing as he has let Phoebe be. And he has this, uh, he has this beatific vision. And this beatific vision that, that Holden has is temporary because we know because he's basically making a confession throughout the entire book. He's not actually fixed. He still hates some of the same things that he hates. But in this final, the reason that Carousel is an appropriate climax is because he finally had, he finally breaks through with his sister Phoebe, Phoebe, who is like that living saint who allows him to see this, to see this moment, to have some sort of movement outside of the self, some sort of salvific moment, if I can, if I can use that word. Um, what I'm not meaning to suggest about Catch in the Rye is that it's an enormous allegory. 
I don't mean to suggest it's like a medieval allegory placed on 20th century adolescence or anything like that. I think importantly, what Catcher in the Rye is doing is taking the adolescent crisis and saying that itself is a spiritual crisis in our culture. That we don't cordon these things off, that it's not a metaphor. The adolescent, the adolescent experience is not a metaphor for spiritual crisis. No, it's, it's just a spiritual crisis of when you're adolescent. And he takes that very seriously because innocence in a corrupted world is not just a cultural idea, but it's a religious idea as well. Um, I'll be perfectly honest. I did not look like an amateur. I did not look at the clock when I started. So I'm going to stop right now because I don't want to step on anyone's toes and I'll leave more questions or more time for questions. Um, but, um, but hopefully, hopefully in just a few minutes that, that made some sense. Thank you so much. You have not gone over long. <laughs> Frankly, if anything, it's you know, brief and you know, therefore you know, we will defer to you during the question and answer and make sure <laughs> fair, you get to talk enough. then. Uh, but thank you so much for being considerate of everyone else. And Professor Graham, may I ask you to go now, please? I'm hoping that you can hear me. Yes. That's, that's a big improvement on earlier. That's great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, all the way from England, it's uh, past dinner time here, so uh, a bit bit of a gear change from my uh, from my day's work. But um, so, what I want to talk about in relation to Catcher in the Rye is the relationship between being a phony and telling lies, and being unreliable, and the ways in which Holden as a character and the narrative in the novel allows us to think about the relationship between those things and, and why they might be important, why they might be important now. So as a reason for the, the book's importance and its longevity and why they might have been important at the time that the book was published and picking up on, on some of what uh, Brent was just saying. So Holden Caulfield says, I'm a terrific liar, I'm, you know, just, just the, most terrific liar you ever saw in your life. And we know that he tells lots of lies, some of them apparently just out of mischievousness, um, as when he um, talks to the woman on, on the train and tells her all kinds of lies about her son and himself and so on. Um, sometimes he tells lies as some kind of idea of self-protection or to, uh, give himself some sort of cover. Um, so he, he adopts quite a few rather unlikely pseudonyms, um, telling people that his name's Jim Steele, for instance, which he obviously thinks is a, is a kind of more grown up sounding name or perhaps a more working class name than, than the one that he has. Um, so there are, you know, there, there are reasons that he, he lies. I think in lots of ways though, although he says he despises phonies, and some readers have said, well, he is a phony because he's constantly telling lies. I think there's something different going on because he doesn't consciously lie to us, the readers, the people who are addressed as you by him throughout the book. So he tells us about the lies that he tells. And he tells us when he's feeling vulnerable and feeling afraid, and he tells us things that he can't tell the people around him. And in that sense, I think he's a really interesting model of a young masculinity that I think was really hard to embody, probably, at the time that the book was written. And, and perhaps that makes him uh, a much more kind of modern and contemporary young man. Uh, than he than he was at the time. Not that young men at the time didn't feel these things, but the impossibility of expressing, say, vulnerability in the uh, in the post-war uh, moment was was obviously a, a huge pressure. So his honesty is is really appealing, but he also lacks self-awareness. Um, and one of the things the narrative does that's really interesting, I think is uh, it allows us to see when he is tripping himself up, he's revealing things to the reader that he doesn't actually know he's doing, 
And it's, you know, sometimes this is quite poignant and sometimes it's, it's very funny. And one of the scenes that I'm thinking of is in the, uh, in the lavender room, the, uh, the hotel bar that he goes to. And he meets a group of women um, in from, from out of town, come to see, come to go to Radio City Music Hall and, and just generally have a, have a wild time. And uh, he's one of the, he, this is one of the occasions when he takes the name Jim Steele. And in his narrative, he's saying, well, you know, I, I'm very tall, I'm very distinguished looking, I, you know, obviously passed for much, much older than I really am. Um, but in this bar, he can't, uh, he can't buy an alcoholic drink. And he just suggests this is just a, a complete nuisance uh, on, on the part of the barman is just not taking him seriously. And he also um, blames the women for not taking him seriously. Um, and there's a, a little bit that I'd like to read that really exemplifies this is Holton um, being a bit of a phony to the women, but we know we know it, so he's not lying to us, a quite complex kind of double shift. Um, but also, um, <laughs> there is so much about the book just really makes, still really makes me laugh, and I've read it about 10,000 times, but um, he says that uh, one of the women, and he's not very nice about the women, he calls this one the ugly one, the other ugly one, Laverne, thought she was a very witty type. She kept asking me to call up my father and ask him what he was doing tonight. She kept asking me if my father had a date or not. Four times she asked me that. She was certainly witty. So you know, there's a, a really strong sense here that um, Holden isn't being, he's not being read the way that he wants to be read. He wants to be understood as, as an adult and he wants to be very suave to these, to these women. And what's driving him mad is that they plainly know that, that he's not an adult at all um, and they won't play along with his fantasy. Um, now, in that case, it's, it's really just um, amusing, but there are points where his self-delusion um, becomes very poignant and really reveals a lot about where he is as a person in his development, in his, in his maturation. And perhaps one of the most, and one of the things that Salinger does so incredibly well is to balance what's poignant with what's comic. Um, and his, his scene with the, the prostitute that he asks to uh, have in his room, and Brent referred to this, you know, where he's, he, this prostitute arrives and he says, well, can we just talk? Um, and I, I agree with Brent, you know, there's a strong sense he that Holden really just wants a sense of connection here. Um, but uh, he says to her, um, look, I said, I don't feel very much like myself tonight. I've had a rough night. Honest to God, I'll pay you and all, but do you very much mind if we don't do it? Do you mind very much? The trouble was I just didn't want to do it. I felt more depressed than sexy, if you want to know the truth. She was depressing, her green dress hanging up in the closet and all. And besides, I don't think I could ever do it with someone that sits in a stupid movie all day long. I really don't think I could. She came over to me with this funny look on her face, like as if she didn't believe me. What's the matter? She said, sorry about the accent. Nothing's the matter. Boy, was I getting nervous. The thing is, I had an operation very recently. Yeah, where? On my, uh, what do you call it? My clavichord. Yeah, where the hell's that? The clavichord, I said. Well, it, actually it's, it's in the spinal canal. I mean, it's quite a ways down the spinal canal. Yeah, she said, that's tough. So uh, well, I absolutely love that scene because I think it's it just, catches that perfect balance where he reaches for totally the wrong word, um, his operation that he's just had on his, on his antique piano, 
Um, and she doesn't know, and she just accepts the brochure and the things um, that, that he's giving her. But for us, there's such a strong sense of his desperation to get away from this situation and to do to himself rationalizing it. Oh, it's depressing, and you know, she's really young, and I couldn't do it for this reason, I couldn't do it for that reason. But I think what he's really doing is, is retreating frantically from this gesture towards adulthood that he's kind of set in motion um, by asking for this uh, prostitute to be brought to his room. So I think throughout the novel, there are these beautifully judged moments, this tremendous balance between Holden being a bit of a phony to other people, being really honest to the reader about how he's feeling, um, and then at some moments being unaware, I think not because he's um, lacks insight or lacks empathy, but because there are things he just can't allow himself to recognize about himself and about him, his situation. And the novel, I mean, people say, oh, it's, you know, it's really simple, it's easy, it's accessible, it's straightforward, all of those things. But actually, it's so complex and so rich. And Salinger's mastery of, of narrative, I think, is just superlative. So I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, we're going to go on to our third presentation from Professor Phillips, if you would. All right. I'm going to start with a passage. And I'm actually going to read a few passages as I talk, and I'm going to read them the way that they were written. So prepare yourself for whatever comes. But the passage I want to start with is from chapter two. And it's when Holden describes himself for us. And he says, I act quite young for my age sometimes. I was 16 then and I'm 17 now. And sometimes I act like I'm about 13. It's really ironical because I'm six foot two and a half and I have gray hair, I really do. The one side of my head, the right side is full of millions of gray hairs. I've had them ever since I was a kid. And yet I still act sometimes like I was only about 12. So that sets up right there at the beginning of the novel, um, some really elemental issues about childhood and adolescence and adulthood. And I see Holden as oscillating between those poles all the way through this book. And for me, it, it structures and arranges what I notice and what I think about the book. I think about um, what he associates with childhood, and that would be innocence, of course, um, and what it means to not be a phony. And then there's what he associates with adulthood, and which is aligned with being a phony for reasons that we can get into that will build on uh, my, my co-presenters' wonderful presentations. Um, but I, I think it's really interesting to trace this oscillation and the way that it works through the novel. And I should say that I've been teaching this novel for 27 years. Uh, I teach it in my Literature for Adolescents class. I have never not taught Catcher when I've taught that class. It's, it's, I tell my students, it's the granddaddy of literature for adolescents, especially in this country. And um, they can take it away from me when I am gone. But until then, Holden will be keeping me company on that journey. Um, one of the things that fits with this idea of the oscillation between childhood and adulthood is the hat and the way that he wears the hat. And I, you know, I've told students, like when I'm giving them a few tips as they're on their way into the novel, I'll say, pay attention to the hat watch when he wears the hat and how he wears the hat and when he has to put the hat away because it'll tell you so much about how comfortable he feels and how childlike he feels and how playful he is. And, and so, you know, I think about um, he'll pull the, the brim around to the back when he's messing around and being a child. Um, he'll put it away when he feels like he needs to be more adult, right? And you can just track so much about his oscillation through the, the wearing of the hat. Um, I find it really interesting that one of the reasons that his roommate and the neighbors in the dorm um, are so frustrated with him is because he's too childish too often. And they want, you know, they're ready for adulthood. They're, you know, eager for adulthood, or at least Stradlater, his roommate is. And 
and he just can't live up to that, right? So, so, and and the last night that he's at that school, he gets um, into a big snowball fight out on the lawn with with other schoolmates and he says it was very childish but everyone was really enjoying themselves and so you have to think about okay why is this 16 year old then 17 now so eager to be childish and you have to think about um, who matters most to him and what the history of his family is. And I, I situate this novel at the beginning of my semester and the first third of the semester is about thinking about identity and how it's shaped by our family dynamics. And this is the perfect novel for that, of course. And, and for Holden, I think time sort of stopped for him when his brother Allie died. Allie was 11, he was 13. I, I feel like he, he can't quite leave that stage behind in part because he hasn't had the opportunity for any rituals of closure. He missed Allie's funeral because he was in the hospital after breaking all the windows. Um, and, and he's just sort of stuck there dwelling on Allie and how wonderful he was. And he says, you know, he was 50 times as intelligent, but it wasn't just that uh, he was the most intelligent member of the family. It, he was also the nicest in lots of ways. And so, so, you know, writing about his mitt or thinking about how he would respond or talking to him later in the novel, um, he's not able to move beyond that or let go of that. And, and that sort of washes over to Phoebe as well. And, you know, sometimes my students say, oh my gosh, when she shows up in this novel, it is a breath of fresh air. You know, they needed a break from what they see as his negativity and they, they love her. And um, she's, she's, you know, um, Brent has mentioned her in his talk already. And she's this, um, she's everything that uh, Holden associates with Allie as well. Um, and she she loves he loves her playfulness that she writes the stories about Hazel Weatherfield, girl detective. Um, he cherishes the memory of going to Central Park with Allie, where they would bring Phoebe between them all dressed up with her little gloves on and she'd walk between them and pay attention to what they were talking about and ask questions. I feel like so much of this novel is him desiring to be back in that moment with these two siblings that matter so much to him. Um, and I'll talk about DV in a few minutes, um, but 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 so much of what he's trying to capture is that life with them. And I, his love for the childhood and his childhood experiences, his siblings and their uh, perspective on the world, it washes over other moments in the novel. Um, when he talks about Jane, it's clear that there's a childishness about her too. I love the detail that she keeps all her kings in the back row. Once they're kings, she doesn't want to move them. She likes the way that they look. And I'm always like, so you can't really finish a game of checkers if you're busy stacking up all of your kings on the back row. And that ties into larger things about not completing journeys, not completing phone calls, you know, sort of that the sort of gaps, right? But but he goes on about, you know, how when you're holding hands with Jane, you never worry whether your hand is sweaty or not. All you know is you are happy, right? Um, and then and there's some other children that are positioned throughout the novel. There's the little girl that he helps with the skates, right? Um, but, but I want to talk about the scene in chapter 16 where he observes a family that's coming back from church. And he um, notices, and I'm going to read just a little bit of this. He says, the kid was swell. He was walking in the street instead of on the sidewalk, but ne right next to the curb. He was making out like he was walking a very straight line the way kids do. And the whole time he kept singing and humming. And of course, he's, you know, singing what the title comes from, you know. Um, and if you haven't seen the Gary Larson cartoon about uh, a body, if a body catch a body coming through the right, I really thought about trying to share screen and share it with you. But that's where it comes from. That's what the kid is singing. The car zoomed by, brakes screeched all over the place. His parents paid no attention to him. And he kept on walking next to the curb. It made me feel better. It made me feel not so depressed anymore. And I really want to think about the spatial layout of that because it factors into how I read the ending of the novel. And so you think about um, the parents are up on the sidewalk and they're walking along and you think about the child and the child is not on the sidewalk. So there's this spatial separation between them. And um, so you, you think about there's a difference between childhood and adulthood. Right. And you think about where he is sort of appreciating that this is childhood, that is adulthood, and he's behind sort of following and watching. I want to move that to the carousel scene, jump to the carousel scene. And I want to think about 
um, how we should read that scene. He's in Central Park. He's with Phoebe. Interestingly, she says, I'm too old to get on the carousel. He says, oh, no, you're not. You need to, you know, you do it. This is, you should do this. Um, and he's watching her. And earlier he has told her the famous passage where he says, I want to be the catcher in the rye. There's this big field of rye and I'm, there's a cliff and I'm at the edge of the cliff and I am going to catch the children and keep them from going over. And as he's watching her on the carousel, there's a famous passage in chapter 25 when he says, all the kids kept trying to grab for the gold ring and so was old Phoebe. And I was sort of afraid she'd fall off the goddamn horse, but I didn't say anything or do anything. The thing with kids is if they want to grab for the gold ring, you have to let them do it and not say anything. If they fall off, they fall off. But it's bad if you say anything to them. And I always put that passage next to the I want to be the catcher in the right passage and ask my students to think about, OK, in, is there's definitely some progress here, but in what way and how should we read it? And I want to share two critical perspectives with you. James E. Miller says, um, that you know, as Holden is watching Phoebe going around and around on the carousel, he has fallen and survived, and he has discovered that he can be happy in the presence of an innocence he no longer has without being a catcher in the ride. All right, so that's one school of thought about that. I would go to Sanford Pinsker and, and share what he says about the ending of this novel that is a quite different view. He says, Holden, of course, remains frozen in his adolescence in a novel dominated by images of stasis, of freezing the snowballs he lovingly packs but refuses to throw at cars or fire hydrants because they too look nice and white, um, the icy lake of Central Park, the unmoving Keatsian figures at the museum. So I'm gonna say that I lean towards Pinsker's view and here's why. Um, after tracking the hat all the way through, it's really interesting. He's given the hat to Phoebe and she's, Put, she's given it back to him and he sort of shoves it in his pocket. He's not even wearing the hat anymore. She comes and takes it and puts it on his head for him and he doesn't move it in any way. And he, he says, well, it really gave me quite a lot of protection, but I got soaked anyway. So I find that interesting. And then I, I, I always ask my students, how would this be different if this uh, attraction in the park were like a roller coaster or some other kind of attraction than a carousel? The carousel goes around and around. You come back to the same place that you've been over and over again. He tells us that it plays the same music that it played when he was little and he rode the carousel. And then the final thing about this is a spatial thing again. Um, all of the children are on the carousel and it starts to rain fairly heavily and the adults go and they put themselves under the overhang. So there's, there's a clear place where the adults are. There's a clear place where the children are and Holden stays on his bench. He's not even moving from his bench. And so he's not a child, but he's not an adult. He's not the innocent child up on the cliff. He's not down at the bottom in adulthood. I, I think of childhood versus adulthood, innocence versus experience, um, not being phony, being authentic as the children up on the, the field. And, and sort of the need for adults to perform. Over and over again, he's looked for a model of an adult who made it to the bottom of the cliff, but wasn't a phony. And you think about somebody like James Castle, who could have maybe been the adult who made it to the bottom of the cliff without becoming phony and of course dies. Um, you think about Mr. Antolini who was possibly the adult that he could trust and respect. Um, and and you know, there's good information about, you know, um, Mr. Antolini sort of aligned with DB and, and any even DB, you know, uh, Holden loves his art, but he sees him as having prostituted himself in Hollywood and thus he has not managed to make it to the bottom of the cliff without becoming a phony. And so I think about Beetle Bailey cartoons at this moment. And I think about, you know, there's always like, the cliff and there's always like that branch that's sticking out from the cliff and I see Holden clinging desperately to that branch halfway down the cliff still stuck between childhood and adulthood and not sure that he wants to let go and experience the rest of that and and sort of laying it out in this way gives us productive conversations when I'm talking about this novel with my students. All right, thank you so much. Just making sure I didn't cut you off there at the end. I don't think I have. Lovely, so look, thank you all. Thank you so much. We now get to go to questions and answers. And 
their questions, your answers. Everybody who is watching, please send more questions into questions Q&A and chat. I will start with uh, Richard Hobby. Modernity has deracinated most people and caused men to lose their two sources of power, land and extended family. This has resulted in impotence, loss of confidence, and loss of ability to take effective action in the world to save or protect anyone. Holden's response to this is to see deeply with, uh, to be a catcher in the rye, that we are all here to save each other. Intense need for salvation because the need is so great in modern times. Uh, do you agree? And I'm actually just going to widen that a bit. Um, is it a modern novel in both the narrow sense and the broader sense? Is it narrow, is, is it a modern novel you know, we are all moderns in the last century or two, da, 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 da. And is it a modern novel, 1880 to 1960, before you switch into postmodernism? How is it emblematic of modernism, both broadly and narrowly? For any and all. I think Brent needs to answer this one. Yeah. Um. Okay, well, uh, like a good professor, I'll be wishy-washy in my answer. Um, th that I don't think, I don't think the crisis of Holden Caulfield can simply be laid at the feet of modernity. Um, uh, I mean, the the text couldn't be. It's not a medieval text. Um, it can only be written in the modern age. Uh, of course, not only because of the sort of accoutrements to the to the narrative, but also sort of how he's conceptualizing himself and others. But I, I do think that like, I, I don't want to turn the text into a museum, that it's a particular response to a particular crisis of modernity. I think Holden's, I think Holden's um, desire um, and a sort of spiritual enlightenment, illumination, a sort of beatific vision, that which he wants is not, is not present, uh, is not readily present before modernity. And I think if you look at the people that he's appealing to, um, so it's the nuns, it's Christ, uh, it's, it's children. Um, you could, I certainly argue, of course, that these, these are people sort of absent of modernity, right? The, the nuns are ancient to medieval and the kids are not really participating in modernity in this way or something like that. Um, and, I, and I understand that, but I, I, I don't think the seat of wisdom at Salinger is just a response to modernity. So I wanna have my cake and eat it too here and say that, yes, there is a, uh, I, I think we can do incredible readings with the family here. And I think the question is a good one, especially about the idea of family. Um, the family is broken up by the idea of the boarding school as much as it is broken up by the idea of death. The family is broken up by DB being out in, in Hollywood. Um, there, is a, there is a trend in a lot of Salinger literature where mothers and fathers fail their children. Um, but I don't, and, and we have these, um, we had these in arguably the Caulfield uh, family, though I think that failure is mitigated because of how much pity he has for his mother and the way it sort of slips in there about how much she grieves for her dead son. Um, but I'm thinking specifically of A Perfect Day for Banana Fish, where there is the sort of deadbeat mother on the beach who doesn't care what happens to Sybil and just sends her away. Um, I can both see that as a product of modernity as she's holding her martini in her hand at her vacation resort, divorced from a sense of, um, of community and land and things like that. But I would also say that the spiritual crisis is is much larger than than just modernity. How's that for blabbing? Awesome. <laughs> Back to you, Anne. Back to you. Oh, I think you said it all. That's awesome. <laughs> and Professor Graham. Yeah, I, that's a really interesting um, answer, actually, <laughs> Brent, and uh, a, a great question. I mean, I often, much as I love Salinger, I think he's much better on men than he is on women. I think a lot of his, I think a lot of his women are the villains of his stories. Um, they are uh, women, they are people who don't 
feel as deeply as the male characters. And apart from the el elusive Jane Gallagher in, in, um, in Catcher in the Rye, that's, that's pretty true. I mean, his, his girlfriend, apart from Phoebe, she's different, she's a child, but adult women um, are generally uh, pretty, at best, pretty vacant. And in a story like uh, Perfect Day for Banana Fish, you know, there's Muriel spending a couple of hours doing her nails and, uh, and so forth, and not understanding uh, uh, Seymour. So I think, but I think on the, on the positive side, he is good um, on masculinity, and he's good at trying to break down the barriers that in, inhibit men through the conventions of masculinity. Um, so I think for that reason, that's one of the reasons why I think it's a book that speaks to its own moment. You know, it speaks to that, that post-war time where gender roles become very hardened again as, as men return from, from war take up jobs, women encouraged to, to get back into the home and, and so on. So it pushes against that. It pushes against those uh, roles that were repressive for, for everybody and inhibiting. Um, but I think as well, Holden, because he's so revealing through his narrative, he's does present a kind of model of, of masculinity that is, is vulnerable, can express, even if it's in a kind of slightly sideways way through the, through the first person narrative, his vulnerability, his fears. And Holden ends up, I think, being, whether he's an adolescent, or, you know, he's on the kind of cusp of, of adulthood, he's a better and different kind of young man from many of the others that we see in the novel. I mean, Stradlater, you know, the, the sexy exploiter of, of uh, his girlfriends, um, the, you know, rather vacant Mrs. Morrow on the train, as it, you know, said, you know, Sally, the girlfriend. Um, and also, People like Antolini, the teacher, I mean, is he an exploiter as well? He was a kind of hero figure to, to Holden, but he lets him down. Um, you know, throughout, Holden encounters men that he sits in contrast to because they're because he's not a because he's not a phony, because he's not macho, because he is vulnerable, because he isn't violent, because he is afraid. Um, and I think. As a, as a model of, of how to kind of uh, tackle the difficulty of, of being masculine. He's, uh, he's, a really, he's really positive. I mean, so much of what he says really resonates, I think, with a, with a readership now. You know, just one of the things that always, when I talk to, with students about Catcher in the Rye is that moment where he talks um, about, about sex and he says, you know, my problem is when I'm with a girl and she tells me to stop, I stop, you know, and you know, th that as a, you know, he thinks, well, you know, this is why I'm not getting anywhere, but actually what he's expressing is a real kind of sense of empathy and sensitivity. Um, and it shows that he's a, you know, he's a, a, a better person than somebody like Stradlater. Thank you. I really appreciate what Sarah just explained. And I'm thinking about the women in Catcher in the Rye. And I would suggest that what Holden sees in Mrs. Morrow, I really love that sequence where he's talking to her on the train. It's, it's playful and funny and kind of sweet all at the same time. But, but he sort of says, you know, she, she looks to him like she, she knows some things about her son that, you know, that maybe other moms wouldn't want to admit to themselves. And so there's that little moment. And then there's, I think about Phoebe, you know, who is so wise and so savvy, even though she's a child. And, you know, what he, what he appreciates about her is the, the sort of childlike 
place that he can keep her in in his mind. But she immediately susses out that he's flunked out of another school. She's immediately thinking about all the things that are going to happen in the family when the news gets out. Um, she's she's really savvy. And so I think there are, and, and I even think about the hat check girl after he's met with Carl who, and he can't find his ticket, but she helps him out and she, and, and he, he trusts her enough that he'll put the hat on for her and show her the hat and she'll say, oh, it looks nice, you know, and they have kind of a nice little moment there that it's almost, it's, a, and, and the nuns, of course, and the wonderful conversation about Shakespeare. And, and I think that the nuns are partly about he sees them as not engaging with the world in the way that somebody like Stradlater is eager to engage with the world and that they are innocent in that sense. But I, I think that it's more likely to be adult women than adult men that he would trust and respect and want to talk to about these big questions. Thank you. I will go on to another question if, uh, I will we keep on always come back to this uh, from Emma Parker. And by the way, I encourage yet more questions to show up. Um, was Catcher in the Rye written for adolescents or about adolescents? And I'm going to add, there is often in this sort of question, a sort of invisible or not so invisible, just written for adolescents or about adolescents, which I think Professor Phillips might have particular words to say about. But I mean, I mean, but, but just to sort of expand this, it became a high school text with extraordinary rapidity. Its audience became, you know, um, adolescents to a remarkable extent. It's actually possibly difficult to remember what it was like when it came out, when it was not yet the high school texts. I mean, in fact, should, you know, was it a natural development that it become one? Do, is it particularly, if not just, written for adolescents or about adolescents? Or is, that, is this, in point of fact, a sort of a publication an artifact of publication and education, you know, English education history. So a couple of things. Uh, G. Stanley Hall coins the term adolescence in 1904. And, um, but that doesn't mean that there's a market for adolescent literature or that authors see themselves as writing for adolescents. And I feel fairly certain that Salinger would be slightly horrified to think of himself as an author for adolescents, that he was going after the great American novel and he was publishing bits of things in East Coast adult uh, venues. Um, I, I always find the publication history and, you know, sort of getting something accepted in 1941, but because of the war, it doesn't get published until 1946. Um, an, an early piece of Holden that does appear in 1945, you know, before the novels published in 1951. Um, I don't think he ever would have seen himself as writing it for adolescents. But I will say that another of the great canonical works of adolescent literature in this country is The Chocolate War by Robert Cormier. And that comes out in 1974. And the, when he did not write that necessarily as an adolescent novel either, that the book companies weren't figuring out that there was a market that they could um, do something with for adolescent readers until the mid seventies. And so, so no, it wasn't. And in the same way, you know, Rebel Without a Cause, which is very much of a piece with Catcher in the Rye in my book, um, and which I do often share with my students in literature for adolescents because it's the granddaddy of the adolescent movies as well. But um, none of that was intended specifically or solely for adolescents. But there's a funny thing about adult culture and the way that it makes its way into children's and adolescent culture that's something that, you know, as it's phasing out or changing in an adult culture will find its way to the nursery, as it were. And this, this novel has become, you know, the, the central novel about identity and adolescence since its publication in 1951. Emma, I hope that's a good enough answer. But it can't be enough. We need two other people to talk about this. Two other people have answers. Or, I, I saw Brent actually turning off his- uh, Go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead, oh, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sarah, Professor Graham. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, no, Sarah, please. Um, I think it's, it's not um, a novel for adolescents. Uh, you know, Salinger didn't aspire to be a writer for adolescents. He, would, he aspired to be a, a New Yorker writer, which is, is what he became. And um, he was a short story person and saw himself as a short story writer. Um, I don't think um, he was aiming to write a major novel. I don't think he, he would have gone for a novel 
um, if he could have avoided it. He was under a lot of publication pressure to produce a novel. And in a lot of ways, Catcher in the Rye is, is so episodic, it, it could easily be a collection of, of short stories with, with linked characters, as, as he does in some of his, his later work. Um, so I think it's, it's not written for adolescents, and I think that's probably why it's often uh, caused some trouble when it's set in, in high schools. You know, it's got a bit of language, it's got the prostitute scene and, uh, and so on. Um, I think one of the reasons that it moved so quickly into adolescent hands, if you like, um, is I, th I honestly think partly because of this uh, model of how to be, how to, how to think in a, in a world recovering from war that both of the, the other speakers have, have referred to. And if you think about uh, men coming back from war, many of them with careers that have been put on hold by the war, coming back, moving into careers in teaching, careers in university, and this novel, which they're picking up on because it's a novel by the well-known short story writer J.D. Salinger, and they're recognizing something in it about a way of coping with the world that they found themselves in. So of course, and um, I, I'm sure that uh, Brent and Anne feel the same, you know, the first thing that you want to do when you read a book that you really like, apart from call up the author, um, is you want to set it on a, on a, a course, you know, you want to share it um, and you want other, you know, you want to, uh, other people that you know, whether they're high school kids or you, your university students to you know see how great it is so I think that's part of its success it gets this big take up um, from uh, people who are, have kind of had similar experiences to Salinger and as they move in to uh, to higher and, and further education they're bringing that novel to their to their students and that way of thinking about contem contemporary America as it is then um, is embraced. I'm going to jump back in for just a second and um, think about this novel is, has such a distinctive voice and it's, it's the voice of a 16 slash 17 year old and I think a lot of teachers thought that that was what made it a great choice for teaching in high schools. But I was telling the other speakers before we got started today that, so in the 25 years that I've been teaching this novel, what I'm finding now is there was a period of time where like the curriculum divisors looked at the Lexo level of this novel and where they put it wasn't in high school, they put it in eighth grade, especially with you know, some of the common core conversations and the sort of evaluating of novels that happened alongside that. A number of schools moved it, believe it or not, to eighth grade because that was the level that it was at in a sort of a structural way, a vocabulary, that kind of thing. And the problem is that nobody in eighth grade who read it had lived enough of that life yet to for the novel and Holden's perspective to resonate with them. And so I've had a number of students over the years who say, oh yeah, they made us read this in eighth grade. And I remember almost nothing about it except that I didn't like Holden and I didn't understand anything about it. And then, you know, when they reread it in college, they're like, oh, I understand so much more about this character now. Eighth grade is just way too young for it. I think, you know, junior, junior year in high school in America is often American literature. And I think that would be a great choice. Um, if depending on how your school district feels about the language in the novel, but it speaks to where those readers are in their lives and experiences. I just, um, to try and blend the two questions we've had together, the idea of modernity, I mean, the separation we're making between say young adult literature and literature is one either made because of large curriculum bodies or because they wanna sell books. Um, when this book came out, there was no such thing as, as adolescent, adolescent literature as a commercial category. Do we think of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird as adolescent or is it literature? Do we think of 
Romeo and Juliet? Do we think of uh, Alice in Wonderland? I, I think even like when it comes to adolescence, and we're not talking about children, we're not talking about children's literature, that this, this distinction between young adult and adult is, is probably not serving anybody besides those that are seeking to perhaps make some money off of the distinction. And, um, and yeah, to Anne's point, it, 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 because the narrator is 16 years old, therefore let's give it to 16 year olds. Okay, I guess we're not ever gonna teach them Don Quixote then because they're never going to be, they're never going to be elderly. So I just would want even just question like that, that impulse in us to distinguish between the two. Um, that quote unquote adult literature could speak to whatever's happening in children and adolescents and children and adolescents can speak to what's happening in the adult world uh, as well. Thank you. As a culture, we have a problem. We all, this per perpetual adolescence has muddied the waters even farther, so. I do think that there's a, a kind of subtlety and depth that, um, a lot of literature written for young adults doesn't have, you know, a lot of um, young adult literature that I've read, you know, however interesting it might be, it quite often will have a, a didactic element. Um, it tends, even the best of it, and it can be absolutely great in its, its own way, but I don't think that very often, and I'm not talking about what I think of as the sort of classics, the kind of text that Brent's mentioned or something like Ursula Le Guin or, you know, those kind of um, novels that, you know, anybody would enjoy and have huge subtleties in them. I think there is, it's got, you know, adult, adolescent literature uh, definitely has a place and it can do lots of interesting things and be a really valuable experience. But I think the reason that um, Catcher in the Rye resonates differently for young, uh, you know, people in their early 20s, say, or their mid 20s or whatever, um, is because the, the reading experience is actually quite complex. So you read it at 13. And you don't really get that, understandably, because it's not really written for the kind of the way in which you read at, at that age. And you, it's understandable that you can't really unpack the, the subtleties of the, the narrative twists and turns. Um, so I think it, to me, it's, there's a difference between a novel that, a, that an adolescent can read because they can read well enough and you know, the, the, the language is um, manageable and uh, a, a book that you should recommend to them because you know, it's going to really resonate with them. So for me, um, Catcher is you know, something that resonates more for an older readership. Thank you. I'm going to impose a question of my own. To what extent is Catcher in the Rye part of, within the American tradition, you know, the WASP tradition, the PrEP tradition, how much of it, it should we be thinking of it in terms of a continuation of Edith Wharton, John Marquand, um, a particular series of novels and literature about a particular social class, and, and how should I put it? Are, it, are Caulfield's fra frailties, the frailties of his class, which we could then continue to say with Stillman and Metropolitan, and how should I put, to what extent was it written that way and to what extent was it read that way when it came out and to what extent has that perhaps been lost with the passing of time? To anybody. Well, I think it, um... It's, it's, a really, it's a really good question. I think that in a lot of ways, it seems like a novel that could be New Yorker short stories. And New Yorker short stories obviously have a very particular kind of characteristic and, and flavor of the sort of thing that you're describing, the, the, the metropolitan, the, the, the middle-class angst and, and so on. 
Um, and so it could easily be, be read that way. Um, but I think one of the odd things about the novel is that it's so much of its time in terms of its language that oddly, it's, it doesn't seem dated, <laughs> which makes, I know that makes absolutely no sense at all, but it seems to be a novel that can be widely read and understood almost despite the fact that it's, it's language, it's the, the world that he moves in is so precisely kind of New York of, of the late 1940s. And, and somehow that it's like reading a, you know, I don't know, a medieval text or something. And so, you know, we, you know we're, not worried, we're not worried about that. We're not worried about the kind of how, how different it is. What we're picking up on is how accessible it is, how relatable it is, you know, the, the connection points are so far out, outweigh the things that are uh, difficult to, um, to understand. I mean, there's phrases in this, in this novel I still don't really understand, but it doesn't matter. Right? I, I'm gonna just say that it's, in some ways it's the, the, the world of the 1930s because you think about when he was born and you think about his own school experiences, multiple school experiences, and the way that he's drawing, at least in that part of the novel, on his own experience. And, and so you've got some of the 30s, you've got some of the 40s sort of tucked into there. I'm, I, I really appreciate the way Holden thinks about his class and its privileges and how much he doesn't care for the differences that that creates between people's experiences. He, he tells the story of the, the fellow student who didn't have the nice luggage. And the student would always hide his luggage like under, you know, put it away and put out Holden's luggage because it was the really nice well-made luggage. And that, you know, he was striving for a different uh, performance of himself at, at that particular upper class school um, through the, the trappings that Holden had there and how uncomfortable that made Holden feel about the fact that some have and some do not have, right? Um, he appreciates, he thinks about the nuns and the work that they do and, and then he thinks about um, relatives and friends and their relatives and how artificial they are in the way that they think about charity work, for example. Um, and, and so I just appreciate the, the perspectives on class. I have to go back just for a minute though. If you have not read much adolescent literature of the last 50 years, you really ought to take a look at it. It's deeper and more significant and more thoughtful than you might expect. And adolescent readers are very sophisticated readers. So. Oh yeah, I, I know. And I have read quite a lot of adolescent uh, fiction, but to me, Capturing the Right isn't adolescent fiction, I guess. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I think this will be our next webinar series, great <laughs> adolescent and children's literature. Clearly we need to have that. Sorry, carry on. No, I was just gonna say this, this thing about um, Holden's kind of class consciousness is so mixed though, because I completely agree with what Anne says. You know, there's this great sense of um, Holden's discomfort with snobbery and you know, uh, the way in which he says, oh, you know, the nuns do this great stuff. And if, if this was my mother, you know, she'd be out showing off, making sure everybody knows she's being charitable. Um, but again, there's that thing occasionally he just kind of trips himself up, like in the lavender room scene, where he says, you know, these, these women were ordering, I, I just happened to have the page open because I was reading it before. And he says, you know, they were ordering Tom Collins's in the middle of December, for God's sake. They didn't know any better. You know, and there's a sense of, oh my dear, you know what? It, so, there, you know, he, he kind of gives himself away sometimes as well. You know, he has these preconceptions and uh, there's a sense that he, he speaks a language of wealth and class privilege that sometimes he's really conscious of and sometimes he really, really isn't. Yes. Professor Klein, did you want to speak to this? I, th I think uh, Holden's sense of, of class is, uh, is one place where comparisons with Huck Finn can stop. The text is often compared to Huck Finn and um, Holden is in search of his gym and uh, there is no gym for him. And, 
and yeah, th these books are not carbon copies off of one another. And it can be helpful to think about Holden as as Huck and his river as New York City streets and and whatnot, and this sort of picaresque novel um, that he's experiencing. But where Holden is at versus where Huck Finn is at is a helpful reminder of a distinction that it is sort of like in this particular moment at this particular at this particular time. Thank you. I am going to go from the wild excursus to my own question back to a question from the audience. Daniel is asking, what was Salinger's reaction to both the critics and public response to the novel? Uh, where, where I think we were say immediately and constructively as opposed to go off to Vermont for the rest of your life and never be seen by a human being again, which we'll sort of, I suppose, take for granted. But <laughs> so responses to, uh, by, reactions by him to the critics and the public's response. And I actually, I should say, and did he think they got anything wrong? Did he think they got anything right? Well, uh, Salinger was, I mean, very human, never more human than his response to the critics, which was telling people he didn't care what they thought. And then he read everything. Um, and uh, no, he did like uh, the, the book is, 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 is an immediate success um, and then only continues to grow, especially when it goes into paperback. And uh, but the, there, there is, a, I, I mean, I think there is a sort of catcher in the rye is something of a of a hinge point in his career where his stories after Catcher in the Rye become much more uh, difficult um, and um, more, there's more religious dimensions to them. Um, and his um, reclusiveness, which can be overplayed. I mean, he, in Cornish, New Hampshire, where he lived, the town knew him. And the town loved him, especially when he bought some property so it wouldn't be turned into a trailer park. He was a youth pastor at one point, going on camping trips with kids in the town. Um, and in fact, after he after he um, after he bought some land, sort of saved it from a development the town didn't want, and people would come looking for him. Uh, they would give famously give him give people wrong directions to his house because they were protecting his privacy. So he's sort of got that Dickinson side to him where his, his reclusiveness is, is a bit um, overblown, but no, that I do think this is part of the, the reason that I, I do think, and again, this, isn't, this is not contrary to any sort of readings about adolescent development or anything like that, but why I do think the book is, um, uh, I don't need to rank it. I don't need to say primarily or anything like that, but it is a spiritual text that is a re deeply religious text and uh, in the wake of Catcher in the Rye, in the wake of a whole lot of critics, but also audience, he was really upset at some of the audience reactions to Catcher in the Rye, um, uh, that they just weren't seeing it for what it was. And whether we want to say that is in the same vein in terms of what we're talking about with adolescent literature versus literature, and that's part of it, or you're, you're not, we're not seeing some of the subtext he's put in it. But there is a frustration um, that grows to the point that he does he, his stories do take a turn, I think, after 19, after the publication in 1951, and then, um, and then in his own sort of lifestyle in Cornish, New Hampshire. Other professors to add to that? Sarah, go ahead. Um, well, I, all I was really going to say was um, that sense in which, you know, as a short story writer, He's a very successful short story writer and a very brilliant one, I think. And this novel is produced and it's reviewed because, oh, you know, Salinger, who you know, writes these stories for The New Yorker, has written a novel. That's why it's, you know, that's why it gets some publicity. Um, and I think that must have been, that must inevitably have been a, a kind of slightly strange experience for Salinger because you don't, really get reviews written of your short stories that get published in this week's New Yorker. Um, and it, get, it does get widely reviewed and published um, in the UK. And I think the sense of discomfort, you know, it's Book of the Month, uh, July 1951. It's, it's picked up by the Book of the Month Club. And that's a level of publicity and exposure that even somebody who aspired to be uh, a frequent uh, writer for the New Yorker 
couldn't really have anticipated. I mean, not the kind of publicity that I guess a best-selling author would get now, but for Salinger, that's a big shift. And you know, just if you just think about the way in which he takes control of the way the book itself looks as an artifact, so it goes from that rather lovely cover with the with the painting of the carousel horses and his picture on the back to the kind of oh and yeah and if you're in Britain uh, it looks like this <laughs> but uh, yeah basically you know there's no blurb the, the, there's nothing there's no author picture there's nothing on the back to tell you what it's about you know it's as plain as it can be ah there we go yeah <laughs> You can have a whole collection of very, very boring book jackets if you collect a lots, of, lots of copies of the Gatra in the right. So there is a sense of, of somebody stepping away from the possibility of, of recognition just again, emblematized in, in the way that he wanted himself to be removed from, from the book and not wanting it to be adapted for screen and 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 so on um so i think you know whatever he you know as brent says you know whatever he he claimed he thought about the reviews or didn't read them or or whatever and some of the reviews were very positive there's a sense of somebody going oh wait a minute you know this this is not what i signed up for and uh and re removing himself so i guess that's part of the story of his reaction. Anne. So, you know, I think about the way that Holden describes Stradlater and he talks about, oh, everybody sees him as, you know, handsome, um, but, but he talks about the razor that he uses to shave and he talks about how cruddy it is. And, and I think in some ways, and, and I go back to Brent so nicely sketched out Salinger's war experience. And for me, that explains a lot of things um, but that's one of the things that he's that Holden is pointing out to us is what's cruddy about life, and and I think some reviewers, especially you know 1951, they weren't ready to think about cruddy. They needed to think about shiny and happy in a way, and to move forward, and you know, and so I think there was a certain resistance, and I'm sure that that must have dismayed him that we couldn't all sort of appreciate what's cruddy at the same time that, you know, we might be moving forward. Um, I, I do know that James Stern wrote a review in the New York Times when the novel came out. And the thing that he liked best about the novel, he said, and, and he used Holden's voice to write his review. So that's always kind of fun to see, um, as so many people have borrowed Holden's voice to talk about things. But he, uh, this reviewer writes, Salinger, he's best with real children. I mean, the ones like Phoebe, his kid sister, she's a personality. Holden and little Phoebe, they kill me. Thank you. Um, style, I wanna ask a question about style. Can we just dismiss this as another New Yorker style prose and it can only be put into the box of New Yorker style mid-century modernism? Or is it more than that? Is that a wrong way to categorize it to begin with? I was doing ex extra mocking accents just for emphasis there. I mean, I, I, would, I would put it in a long history of uh, the American vernacular in literature. Um, I would go all the way back to Sut Love and Good um, and the uh, sort of Southwest American humor stories. And then we're moving into um, Walt Whitman and Huck Finn and with Twain. And um, even sounds strange because it sounds so European, but Henry James and what he's trying to do with internal monologues as a kind of vernacular, mapping that out. Then you get to Hemingway and Hemingway is, I think, working with a particular vernacular and Sun Also Rises has about 10 different entries in the OED. Um, and, then, and then the Salinger is sort of a next, is, is another move in that. Um, I don't, I, I mean, if it, so to, to answer the question, if, if it is a product of a particular mid-century New York, then that's no less a criticism than Huck Finn is the product of mid-19th century um, Missouri. Anyone else want to reject my, my nasty tone and have an answer there? 
Well, and I'm feeling smug because I have just found a way to bring Little Women into this conversation. And that is that Little Women was celebrated for its American realistic voice when it came out in 1868. And I think that Holden also is a real and realistic and compelling American voice. And so I will resist a New York classification. I think it's an American classification. Dude, thank you. Professor Graham. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that it, it raises that whole question of how does how does Holden how does Holden sound to non-American ears? I mean, it's it's pretty clear from the many many discussions I've had in, in living in, in the UK with students that you know we can't we can't say goddamn. We just it just doesn't work. We can't we can't do it and make it sound uh, the way it should. But one of the things that is really interesting about, about Holden is the way that he moves in and out of different kinds of registers of voice. And quite often his own narrative is, can easily read as a kind of standard American English, um, even though what he's saying is uh, often very informal. Um, so, you know, the, the, in the scene with Sonny that I talked about earlier, you know, he says to her, I've had an operation on my, what do you call it? And, the, and Salinger writes it out, you know, as it sounds my, in my clavichord. But most of the time he isn't talking in that kind of voice. It's uh, people like taxi drivers, or, you know, that use that kind of um, sort of dialect that's written out as, as an accent. Um, so Holden, in some ways, speaks in a standardized way that's, that indicates his class and his, his education. Um, but then he has these um, kind of what he says, um, part of the comedy in some way comes from the way in which he's often quite, quite rude, but in that very standardized English. And, you know, we're just going back to... Um, the, the scene that, um, that Anne was talking about with, with Mrs. Morrow on, on the train. Um, and uh, this, this is just, um, so he, he's just got started talking to her and she says, oh, do you go to Pensy? She said, she had a nice voice, a nice telephone voice mostly. She should have carried a goddamn telephone around with her. Yes, I do, I said. Oh, how lovely. Perhaps you know my son then, Ernest Morrow. He goes to Pensy. Yes, I do. He's in my class. Her son was doubtless the biggest bastard that ever went to Pensy in the whole crummy history of the school. You know, so there's this kind of lovely shift between, you know, Holden talking politely to a mother in the, in the appropriate voice for addressing mothers. And then the private voice, okay, it's not slang, but it's a different kind of register and it you know, sort of reaches to the reader uh, it really strongly because he's kind of saying, you know, those guys, we, you know, everybody's got one of those guys uh, at school. And uh, one of my favorite um, insults uh, in the whole in the whole book it actually comes in in this scene later on when Mrs. Morrow says, "Oh, you know, Ernest you know, is he's he's uh, he's very sensitive," and Holden says, "Sensitive? It's about <laughs> as sensitive as a toilet seat." <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's just so much lovely uh, comedy that that comes not just from what he's saying, but the kind of shifts in in tone that come from from how he uses language which may, may be drifting away a bit from the question, but... Uh... It's a good drift, thank you. Um, I'm going to go for a question from user one. I almost suspect a pseudonym. Did Salinger ever discuss the meanings of the novel? What was his intention? And I guess I will sort of, always pushing. Are there things he wanted for meanings which people should have been picking up more you know, in their reader responses? And I must say, are there meanings of the novel which he didn't intend, which nevertheless are still really good stuff, even if he doesn't recognize them, he argues against them? I, d I don't think you have, you don't, there, we don't have this long history of him talking about, he's not doing interviews about this book, like that just does not exist. He's not interested in, in talking about that at all. Um, and uh, I mean, I think we can fairly say he didn't want it to be um, 
culturally connected with a couple of uh, assassins, uh, like it is with Mark David Chapman and John Hinckley. Uh, especially Mark David Chapman shoots John Lennon, sits down, starts reading the book. Um, when the police find him, he's reading the book. I think we can fairly say that's not his intention. Um, but yeah, there's not a history of interviews or anything like that. He he does not want to engage in that world. Yeah, it's really hard, isn't it, to to talk about um, intention because we don't we don't have that. And but in in some ways, we might we might turn that around and see that as a liberation because in some ways all of the conversations that we're that we've had this evening um, and all the kind of many conversations in in classrooms and at universities and in books and journal articles in some ways we're kind of liberated by the fact that there isn't that history of Salinger saying no you know the key thing was that it's a such and such a text, or what I really wanted everybody to get was you know, the the thing about the war, or about Christianity, or about loss, or you know. so we, you know, we're in a lot of ways that freedom that we kind of wrench from authors who often are kind of trying to hold on to interpretation. Here, in this case, Salinger's kind of freed us to to do it without without any any fight. And uh, I, I like that about the novel. And the, the novel and Salinger's other work make that possible because there is so much depth in all his work. Thank you. Um, anyway, Professor Phillips, have you responded to this yet? Or are you? Oh, yes. Hmm, the, the connection looks like it might be a little frozen there. Um, well, I was actually getting to the point where I was going to ask for people to just do their concluding remarks, um, you know, a minute or so. May I ask each of you if you would um, do some concluding remarks? Um, I, I'm going to ask just to get out of this rot of alphabetical order. Professor Graham, I ask you to go first, then Professor Klein, then uh, Professor Phillips, if her connection works and gets back on again. Overthrow the alphabetical system. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll try not to digress as I, as I did before. Um, I think I keep coming back to this novel and I'm absolutely convinced of its value because it repays reading after reading. And, you know, we read it at different times in our lives and in different circumstances. And there's always something to enjoy. There's always something thought provoking. And I was looking, th looking through the novel over the last few days in, in preparation for this and spotting things. Oh, I never noticed before. Oh, actually the way that he says that. And oh, you know, that's really interesting. So there's, there's so much in it. And I love the way that it has this superficial, if you like, um, simplicity. And this, accessibility, everybody can come in and, and read this and it will resonate differently with them um, different, at different times in different places. And, you know, if there's, a, if there's any kind of way of measuring the importance of a novel, it, it surely must be that. It's, it's capacity to, to mean and keep meaning and, and keep kind of developing with readers. And I think ultimately, um, whatever the specifics of what it's about, and there are lots of different specifics. Um, one of the things that I take away from it is it's, it's about thinking about how to be human under pressure. And uh, perhaps that's, that comes back to my feeling of this is why it's still an important novel now, because we're still trying to answer that, that question. Thank you. And for concluding remarks, then Professor Klein. Yeah, I, I've been reading this book for almost like 30 years of my life. Um, there's not a lot of books I can say that about. And I didn't think it was very funny when I first started reading it as 16 to 17. But dang it, in my 40s, it just keeps getting funnier and funnier. Um, so, so to second uh, Sarah's point about this, it's just so comebackable uh, as, uh, as a novel. I will say, uh, and this is my own pride and vanity that I'm having to slay here, but 
you know, if you tell someone one of your favorite books is Franny and Zoe, I think you, that person's like, oh yeah, I get it. That's, you know, it's really de- dealing with up here stuff. And then you say Catcher in the Rye. And I think you can get the response from adults being like, really? Like the one we read when we were sophomores in high school? Um, and perhaps it is due to my own insecurity of that, but I actually do think that this is actually the case that the book is profoundly interested in, um, uh, in metaphysical matters, in eternal matters. And uh, the way that it's able to do that authentically in a 16 year old, 17 year old's voice is unpre- I mean, tr- I, I mean, unprecedented. I can't think of another book that does it like that, that weds these two things together. Again, not one being an allegory for the other, but instead just taking it and putting it inside the life of an adolescent. Um, and for that, if for no other reason, um, it becomes one of our most important, uh, one of our most important novels. Thank you. So thank you so much. Um, Professor Phillips is supposed to do the last thing and she just had her connection break again. I'll just say a few things. Well, hopefully she'll be able to get back on in a moment. Um, so thank you everyone. I will say, I'll try to delay. Ah, there's, wait. Professor Phillips, would you like to do a quick minute before your uh, concluding remarks before your connection breaks? Yes, and I don't know what's happening. All of a sudden it's bad, but uh, there are some novels that you can read all by yourself and have a wonderful experience with them and learn a lot. There are other novels that blossom under conversation. And this is one of those novels. And, you know, I, like I had not read it until I was teaching it, but I le- learned quickly to love this novel in those conversations with students. And it continues to, you know, it's always surprising, always new. I'm thinking about Riley, who's a student of mine this semester and who may be with us today. And he told me last week that this is the fifth time that he has read this novel. And I hope he's writing about it because clearly he's got some more things to say about it. But, and, and, and just all the people who said, I didn't like Holden, but now I have this new insight to him. It's a rich and rewarding and wonderful novel. And I love teaching it. And I've loved getting to listen to and learn from my fellow panelists today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Look, so, and that's my thank you also. Thank you to the panelists. It's been wonderful listening to you. Thank you to the audience. Uh, it's for you and it's made possible by you, um, uh, you by, by providing your questions. Uh, so, we do this for you. Um, I want to make some quick advertisements, therefore. We have. One, the possibility, if you have further questions, send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org. Be glad to forward them to the panelists uh, to get more um, answers to your questions. Up and with up recording within 24 hours on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. And further stuff coming along, uh, we have you know, you know, all sorts of webinars being done by the National Association of Scholars. I will mention, we have on October 6th, you know, a report on Middle East Study Centers. We have further literature webinars, including Last of the Mohicans on October 11th, you know, Taipei, uh, The Sun Also Rises, Fall of the House of Usher. Oh, it's going to be a fun series. And we also have our American Innovations webinar, um, where we have just come off of the age of rail, uh, and we're going to be going on to the age of the automobile. That's scheduled for October 18th. One last blurb. If you enjoyed this, think of becoming a member of the National Association of Scholars. Um, we're good folks. And, 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 and you know, your, your money will go to good, good purposes, like ice cream for the staff. Having said all that, um, again, thank you all so very much. Thank you, especially to our panelists. It's been wonderful. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. Bye.